Okay, so welcome everyone to the ICTS String Seminar. So today we are very happy to have Sabrina Pastelski from Perimeter, who will tell us about uh, revisiting the flat space hologram. So please, Sabrina, over to you. Thank you guys for coming. Um, so yes, I'm happy to be uh, giving a talk about two uh, recent -ish papers, uh, with the uh, latter one being one with um, basically uh, Laura Donne and Andrea Poom. So many thanks to them. Okay, so celestial holography and celestial amplitude are two, I guess, buzzwords or like words of uh, terms of art for this subfield that I want to, I guess, make sure I define before I go into um, revisiting the flat space hologram. But basically, celestial holography uh, is this proposed duality between a gravitational scattering system in asymptotically flat space times and some CFT living in the celestial sphere. And when I refer to celestial amplitudes, it's going to be more of a, at first, a kinematic statement which that is that I'm basically taking my S matrix elements and transforming them to a basis where under the Lorenz group, they will transform as conformal correlators. And so the point of this talk is to um, present, um, I guess, how we're viewing the celestial hologram and basically why reducing it down to this co-dimension two hologram is a natural thing to do and why that might take better advantage of the available symmetry. So we're gonna kind of uh, revisit the motivation for this. Now, again, the main motivation for this program, because it's been developed over some time, and we have um, some people in the audience have worked on this stuff, is kind of this timeline where one of the first results is along the lines of identifying a connection between soft theorems and word identities. So um, one of the computations I'll say today, the first of the two papers I'm talking about, is actually revisiting that, that first kind of motivation in the hindsight of this change of basis that we're doing. Um, those soft operators looked like they were currents in a CFT, and that kind of motivated a change of basis, which um, has led to this whole kind of dictionary between the celestial hologram um, and what we know about amplitudes and finding new symmetries from the celestial perspective. So basically, the, the sets of infinite symmetries kind of tie bookend this, this like short timeline. Um, and then the main thing is instead of going off into interesting questions about IR divergences, um, I think most of the recent work has been um, trying to look at the S matrix uh, in this different basis. Okay, so synopsis for this talk today. The first thing we want to do is we're going to revisit just the task of going from uh, this bulk asymptotically flat space time to some boundary dual, and in particular into the celestial construction, how we reduce further down to the celestial sphere. And then I'm going to go through the, the first paper, which is a streamlined route from the asymptotic symmetries in 4D to these currents in 2D, um, which will basically put front and center the fact that we're doing radial evolution in the 2D theory. Um, and this route's going to make the relation between the soft theorems um, manifest. And that was the first part of our timeline. And then it also will give a little bit of insight into how we're viewing the uh, bulk versus boundary in celestial CFT, as opposed to like the lovely work of, of Subrat and others um, that was presented, I guess, a couple of strings ago. Um, which is again, like we're, we're still slicing the Vulcan boundary, but we're just doing it in a different way. And so that's gonna be the emphasis here. Um, and then this is gonna compare basically Suvrat's work and other Carolian peoples with uh, the way that celestial construction works, um, which will basically just be different cuts through uh, both the Vulcan boundary. And then finally, we're gonna basically revisit massless scattering with now how we're viewing the celestial basis as compared to other types of evolution. Um, and then discuss the advantages of the celestial framework. So hopefully the point is, after all of this, we're gonna see that maybe some of the tools that we were, would be used to from ADS-CFT do carry over, but we're making some different choices for how we're cutting the Vulcan boundary. And then that perspective should be helpful for, I guess, comparing like, like what one would want to naturally do moving forward with that. Um, and also gives some insight into why maybe we would have wanted to reduce to this co-dimension two theory um, from the get-go. Okay, so outline for today, there's gonna be two introductory sections. The first one is just viewing the S matrix for any basis as this boundary correlator. And then the next one is the celestial amplitudes framework because some aspects of the amplitudes are gonna be selected um, in this basis. Then we wanna just make sure that we, we know what celestial amplitudes are mechanically and not just as the representations of the um, external states. And then I'm gonna go into the, uh, the first paper I mentioned at the beginning of the first slide and then go back to the title of the talk. So it should be fun. Okay, so 
have, feel free to ask me questions at any time because uh, I tend to talk faster when I have no questions. So if you see me talking fast, it means ask me a question. Um, my goal for today is to apply the holographic principle to um, a vanishing cosmological constant space times. And so basically what's going to happen is the plan is that this proposal again is co-dimension two. So we're going from some scattering process and we're going to focus mostly on massless scattering uh, to some um, operators and certain dead points in the celestial sphere. And so asymptotically flat space times are again, Venetian cosmological constant, but non-zero stress energy tensor sources. And so the class of metrics that one gets is no longer gonna be flat anymore, but is gonna be basically look flat far away. And that's why it's called asymptotically flat. And in the case where there's no horizons, uh, these asymptotically flat space times still have the same conformal boundary structure. So I've drawn a double Penrose diagram just to see uh, where one particle just goes straight through the space time. And when one does so, we have basically the main feature of interest here is that the conformal boundary of Minkowski space includes components that are these null components, which um, capture the Cauchy data for uh, incoming massless scattering um, process and the same outgoing. So massless particles will enter through um, square minus and exit at square plus. And so basically these null helper surfaces are real uh, coordinate, which is the advanced retarded time times the celestial sphere. And then a massive particle, by contrast, would go from um, past time like infinity to future time like infinity. And then all of these interesting uh, antipodal matching conditions that are kind of key to tying together the in and out states are happening at spatial infinity here. OK, so maybe if one said, let's like try to find a hologram, um, there are two senses in which we already, I guess, can view um, either scattering as uh, something that's intrinsically co-dimension one by nature of the fact that we're looking um, at properties of an on-shell amplitude um, that are supposed to encode consistent bulk physics. So to what extent when you're um, divining um, features of like these like local interaction terms or, or um, basically consistency of evolution in the bulk, that, that the way it's imprinted on this theory that is just a function of the on-shell data um, kind of is like going from some co-dimension uh, one theory to the bulk, that would make sense if you actually had some rules for, for like evolving or like determining consistent S matrix in strict, strictly in terms of the on-shell data. So it's like kind of a different reorganization of the S matrix if you wanted to make it seem more like how we would normally view a hologram uh, in the more familiar context of ADS CFT, where we have some cosmological constant and um, of maybe the wrong sign compared to what we see uh, in the real world. But in that case, basically the co-dimension there is coming from the fact that that dual CFT are some operators on the boundary. And so we can reconcile at least these, that aspect of these constructions, which is we can go from this co-dimension one um, set of on data to some correlators in the boundary, especially more clearly in the massless case. By, for the massless uh, example, evolving our Cauchy slice to the far future and far past. And so strictly speaking, the same thing can happen for massive if we resolve kind of the uh, behavior at, um, I minus and I plus, but what we're basically doing is whatever state we want to prepare for our inner or out states, we're preparing it by um, basically pushing what would a late time Cauchy slice would basically go, um, would end on both sides at I zero here, the full S2. And now we're basically deforming it so that we're hugging scry. And in formally doing so, we can think of the in and out states as being prepared via data on scry plus or scry minus. So we still have two components. We have this extra index for all of our fields saying if it's in the future or in the past. But one thing that we get for free on top of that, and this is something that also plays a role in the earlier soft theory because word identity derivations, is we get kind of something for free, which maybe we didn't necessarily need, which is that there is a sense in which something local on, um, so like if I have a plane wave scattering, then the large R limit at fix U or V will localize me to one point in the night sky. And so on top, all I needed to say that I have an inner and out state that's a function of um, the uh, boundary values of these uh, bulk fields would have been just that I take some inner product with the wave function on this out state. So it could have been smeared anywhere on this sphere, basically. But I get one extra step for free, which is that basically it looks now like I'm literally on one generator of, so one point in the sphere, but along the full generator of scry to get a standard plane wave. And I can just as well Fourier transform back if I wanted to not look at a plane wave basis. And that's gonna be part of the point. So the thing for me that I wanna emphasize here is the subtle point approximation somehow makes it natural to think about 
basically, depending on how I cut this boundary, can I still like think of these operators as somehow being like localized on um, some patch of the night sky, et cetera? This is going to be part of the reason why uh, the standard celestial dictionary, which is just um, a melon transform in these uh, single particle states, still looks kind of local on the S2. Um, so just want to emphasize that that Saddle point approximation is going to help for, for part of the dictionary, but strictly speaking for this boundary correlator, these things could have been smeared. Okay, so I'm going to now focus just on the S matrix so that when we talk about celestial amplitudes, the um, some aspects of it are not going over people's heads if they're not uh, familiar with this subfield too much. So S matrix is a function of on-shell data. And basically in this talk, I'm going to talk about massless examples, but we can always kind of go back and, and ask about massive. And in the massless case, I have a sign for in or out. I have a positive energy variable, and then I have projective coordinates on the Riemann sphere, which give me a direction of the light cone. Now, Lorentz transformations in Minkowski space are doing global conformal transformations on the celestial sphere. So basically, at least just at the level of kinematics, I can choose different wave packets so that we already know that this the single particle um, states for the massless scattering have these little group uh, transformation laws, which correspond to like the representation of the helicity. And in addition to that, we're basically taking this integral over different energy scales so that we pick up, in addition, a definite eigenvalue under boost towards the direction of where one of the particles wave momentum is pointing. And so that's how, in this massless case, we're constructing this wave packet. But otherwise, it's just a formal um, choice of external wave functions such that my amplitude transforms like it's a correlator of some co-dimension two CFT. So this can be generalized to co-dimension two, not just 2D in the 4D case. Okay, so Mellon transforms are like a boost. We already know the little group matches the 2D spin. And so we have these, these weights uh, H and H border. Now the celestial holographic map then is basically doing that Mellon transform on my S matrix that I already have. And so in order to do that, one different thing compared to normal ADS CFT dictionary is really this boundary is, again, a three manifold still. So we haven't actually gotten rid of a dimension. We've just basically kind of encoded the dimension in something that's from the 2D perspective looks like a continuous spectrum of conformal dimensions. And so that's why there is this principal series value of the weights. But there's a sense in which there are various contexts in which we want you to deform um, the value of the conformal dimension off the principal series, or basically try to deform that contour and pick up poles at different places. So one should be a little bit flexible and think about in the same way that one would analytically continue the um, on-shell kinematics and talk about like analytic S matrix and whatnot, even though that is still on, in progress to like really, I guess, understand the analytic structure of celestial amplitudes, because most of um, the easiest thing to do is to just try to like carry over things that you understand from the um, normal momentum space to these guys, and there's a little bit of work to do there um, to make sure because whatever, like the analytic properties of an integral are not the same as the the, the integrand. Um, but basically, understanding that better will, I guess, give a better picture of how we want to complexify both the celestial sphere coordinates, which can take you to the celestial torus or different signatures, and the conformal dimensions. So one nice feature, which was in this paper by um, Arkani Hamid et al., is essentially that. Um, the analytic structure in, in delta seems to be somewhat nicer than in omega because uh, various like logs that appear at loop order would turn into higher order poles uh, depending on how you implement an IR cutoff, at least for, for the naive evaluation of those things. So there's some nice feature about the analytic properties in delta that I think will be more interesting as people explore that further. And so that's one thing to keep in mind. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that collinear limits of scattering are going to get mapped to the celestial OPE. So like very naively, we're kind of forcing on ourselves. Um, as we take two operators close, we know what that means from this bulk perspective. We're taking these two uh, light ray integral smeared um, operators. So basically two generated scry fields that are probably approximately free and like this is, so depending on cluster decomposition or whatever you can assume, the behavior of the fields at infinity, we know what it means to take two operators close in the Cecil sphere from the 4D perspective. So that's always good to keep in mind. We can lift these stories up. So the main reason that people went into this basis in the first place though, is that there's not just the supposed um, SL2C Lorenz invariance that we have, um, we also supposedly have a Virasaur symmetry. And so that's coming from the fact that there's a certain subleading soft theorem in gravity. And that basically says that the way that that subleading soft graviton is coupling to each of the external states can be recast in some with some smearing and some definition of this operator um, that 
uh, so sublating soft graviton couples to Rindler energies, and a particular smearing of sublating soft graviton gives me a candidate stress sensor. So there's a couple of things to be wary of is the fact that, first of all, I'm smearing, um, like one of the things that I was bragging about with this construction with the saddle point approximation is that all of my particles look like they're localized at points in the night sky. And so that's going to be good for the next part of the chalk. And so one should revisit whenever you have to define operator that's basically smeared on the celestial sphere, uh, what that will mean from the point of view of kind of um, what I'm going to do in the next step. So let's keep that in mind. So, so, sorry, Sabrina, yeah. is, this, oh, yeah. is, this, uh, is this coming basically from the way these states transform into super translations? I mean, is this is this, this is coming from a super rotation? So that's exactly sorry. <laughs> like I'm glad that you asked about why why these things come from. So okay, so the first thing to keep in mind is that as I've presented it right now, because I wanted to lean into, I just have an amplitude that I could change a basis for. Then nice features of it I might discover from really pushing um, this this dictionary. And so what I didn't show here was if I really wanted to ignore the whole celestial uh, origins of story. I could say, okay, let me say that I'm going to do radial evolution in this 2D theory. What would like the symmetry algebra look like from the collinear limits if I'm allowing myself to complexify things like that? I could build up parts of the story that I maybe actually wouldn't see so easily from the book. But the origin of the motivation comes from the fact that we know the soft theorem already and we know an asymptotic symmetry that tells me that I should have this soft theorem. And so those things in the timeline, I guess, is the order of events and why we would go to this space in the first place. But one could have found that at delta goes to zero, there's a certain uh, factorization of the amplitude and that the residue there when smeared on the celestial sphere gives me a word identity that looks like a stress sensor. So you could do it at the level of just looking at, um, well, you, you need to know the, 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 the feature of that pole, but one could kind of try to reverse engineer where a possible stress sensor could be and then ask um, if you can show that word identity from the behavior of the celestial amplitude, for instance. Okay. Okay, thank you. I have yeah. a question. Yeah. So, uh, is the understanding that you always work in the collinear limit because that gives rise to the OP, or are so there the, are ways of working beyond the collinear limit in the bulk? So, so the thing that we, you could take this transform and do non collinear limit stuff. The, the attitude of the celestial logographer is that, okay, I've kind of kinematically forced myself into the situation where I have all the right kinematics for a 2D CFT module of the fact that I have this continuous set of uh, this continuous spectrum. Now, in the case of the 2D CFT, I want to know the spectrum and I'd want to know the uh, OPE data and then try to bootstrap the amplitude kind of from there. And so there is a sense in which people are looking at the collinear limits of scattering because they want to find structures similar to what they would would think was the fundamental data in the in the, the 2D CFT if it really were 2D CFT. So that's why people focus on the collinear limits. Um, and in that case, at the end, I'm going to close with this W infinity symmetry, um, which is kind of, I guess, a nice um, example how you can go from uh, EFT coefficients in the bulk to collinear uh, behavior, and then from there to symmetry algebras in that theory. Um, and so I think that's a beautiful way of trying to reorganize things. But then again, of course, right, like strictly speaking at loop order and things like that, like you're helped by the fact that things are easy to do also at, at tree level in that context. But you don't strictly speaking need to go to collinear limits. It's just that you'd want them to converge if you really want this CFT like structure to um, to be the thing that you can uh, use as the starting point for um, writing down the full correlators. So strictly speaking, if you have this OP that actually converges or something like that, then the mechanics of, I guess, writing down um, higher point correlators from the lower point ones using a conformal block type of composition should strictly work as long as you can handle the fact that there's um, not just uh, Lorentz invariance, but Poincaré invariance. So there's some sort of, for some reason, the blocks are a bit um, trickier to actually play with, but the OPEs are easier to extract because in that context, you can basically look at collinear limits away from any sort of momentum conservation constraints and still see that um, at least for the single particle external states, the uh, OP data kind of matches what you would expect. Um, so in the sense that collinear limits on the celestial sphere correspond to splitting functions and, and things like that. So, okay, um, I know I rambled a little bit there, but hopefully that motivation of why we look at collinear limits makes sense where it's more to define the CFD structure uh, rather than something that you necessarily had to do to write down correlators in the spaces. Okay, so- but The motivation be to find the expression for the scattering amplitudes in the bulk? I mean, 
when you yeah, have so the, non non collinear i mean yeah when you have non collinear uh, particles mm-hmm. uh, shouldn't the approach be that what should the relevant analysis be in the celestial cft uh, to see how things get simplified uh, the whole point of the program right yeah so 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 my one point of the program so again i don't want to so i think the thing that a lot of people were hoping is that if we have a good handle of the celestial opes then we build up correlators using something like a CFT conformal block decomposition rather than via perturb- perturbation theory and Feynman diagrams. And so we're trying to reorganize scattering in terms of soft and collinear limits, where basically the soft limits are like basically constraints on the residues of these collinear limits, for instance, in some in some sense. Um, and so basically in that context, like we're hoping that we can reorganize the full S matrix in terms of the same way that one would reorganize uh, a, um, a CFT, which is naively like very different than how one would do perturbation theory. So this is the same type of thing like the amplitudes program is trying to find um, ways around like cumbersome, like large numbers of Feynman diagrams that simplify drastically in the end. So I would say that's the way that I see the motivation. But again, there are things you can learn in the, in the meantime, which maybe will be like to ha- how to handle colonial limits at like loop order and things like that. Because even like um, soft limits, I think you get some sort of insight from um, in this context that I wouldn't maybe have expected um, just for starting from amplitudes and trying to find like the soft theorems to subleading orders. Is that, is that a sufficient thing or, or, or do you want to? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. Great. No, and I'm also happy to, and maybe after this talk, there's going to be more, um, I'll go back to some of the symmetry algebra so we can debate even more then. Okay. So what I was just saying is that basically, okay, you do this Lorenz transform, like this, uh, transformation of the external states so that you have nice uh, representations of the Lorenz group. That's fine and dandy. That's just a um, kind of choice of representation. You shouldn't get much more than you can by intertwining between the plane wave uh, Wigner uh, representations and the um, ones here, which have the gate back to rule and others uh, and naively. So the main punchline or the thing that kind of motivates you that there might be something even richer if I go to the spaces was originally that there's these soft theorems that look like these extra currents. And so let's take a step back to how one found those in the first place. So the point is, is that I already talked about the fact that I can write everything in terms of boundary limits of my fields. So if I really want to think of a boundary limit of my graviton, say, then I should know how my graviton is behaving at the boundary. And so asymptotically flat space times have a kind of universal structure of, um, how they approach flatness, or at least we we want that to not be broken. Um, and so Bondi, Vandenberg, Metzer, and Sachs set up a nice gauge for looking at how to go to the boundary. Um, and basically what happens is once you try to gauge fix, there's this kind of um, shuffling that goes around between um, in my gauge, I can't fully gauge fix everything. Um, and so I see basically that there's some set of physical fall offs that I want to say like, okay, all physical scattering processes will fall off like in one over R at a certain rate. What are residual gate transformations that preserve these falls and there's kind of a back and forth where basically I have to balance the um, physical falls that I'm allowing and then the s- symmetries of that um, class of solutions in this phase space. So I'm like restricting down to a physical subspace of this potential, like just writing down a metric without, I guess, taking any attention to real analysis or whatever there um, before, before CK come along, comes along. So basically, that's the procedure for how one goes about um, trying to find what asymptotic symmetry group there is. And so one thing that's going to be going to point out in the end of this is that somehow in the celestial basis, if you understand the amplitude, you can try to use the amplitudes to find for you what um, symmetries you might have. So the allowed um, symmetries mod the ones that kind of don't make it to the boundary are what's conventionally called the asymptotic symmetry group. And so one uh, downside of kind of, again, this balancing act that one is doing is depending on what you consider physical, you can exclude some things or not. So Bondi, Van der Rieg, Metzer, and Sachs found that they couldn't fix their BMS frame, by which they mean they couldn't fix um, a, like super translation symmetry in a natural way. So they wanted to maybe, or I think there's some interpretation where they wanted to find Poincaré coming out of this asymptotic analysis. So obviously you don't actually have an isometry anymore. You have this class of metrics. Can I still see that there is something like a Poincaré invariance in this picture? But they get something extra. They get these uh, super translations in addition to the Lorenz group. Now, if they had decided that it's okay to have punctures in the celestial sphere, they would even have more symmetries, which would be the super rotations, which are like local conformal transformations in the celestial sphere. 
And so basically this starting point of Andy and friends's program was Andy's observation um, that basically the ward identities for these asymptotic symmetries were equal to the soft theorems. And so that's where the kind of universality of the subleading soft theorem is coming from the fact that we have a symmetry where we know that where there's a hard part and a soft part of a, the kind of the lead derivative along um, these, these guys. So before I say too much about, I guess, the mechanics of that ward identity, like let me just abstractly emphasize that the kind of universality of certain soft theorems is coming from the fact that there is an asymptotic symmetry associated to them. But say I had already known the set of asymptotic symmetries that I wanted, is it obvious that they would be soft theorems? And so the, the part of the talk now is basically going from the canonical charges for some asymptotic symmetry and seeing that if I take the celestial perspective by which I mean that I'm looking at operators in this 2D CFT where I'm basically going to look at say um, commutators that are like radial commutators and whatnot. So I'm gonna to try to look at radial evolution in CFT and see that that perspective actually naturally would tell me that I should look at soft theorems as being a manifestation of these word identities. So that's gonna be kind of one of the fun outputs of this, this uh, first paper. And so basically in the original story of the program, asymptotic symmetries were kind of known by Bondi and then recently more explored, um, like the subleading soft theorem wasn't known back uh, in Weinberg, so there's kind of this interplay between this connection. But Bondi knew about super translations. Weinberg knew about um, the, sub, the leading soft gravitons and photon theorems. And then uh, Andy, sorry, and I guess there's some iterations before where people saw that these are the same manifestation. They're both IR physics. But the nice thing about understanding the connection is that one maybe found more soft theorems, could motivate more asymptotic symmetries, yada, yada. And then after that, recast those soft operators as currents in the 2D theory. So you're really going back down. And it's part of the fact that basically the parameters for these asymptotic symmetries are essentially functions of the sphere because you've gauge fixed away. So you've kind of, the first gauge fixing that go to Bondi gauge gets rid of um, the arbitrary X, like or four coordinate dependence. And you're kind of left with profiles where like the, the value at a certain cut in Scry is the initial data for the rest of your gauge fixing. So that's the mechanics of, I guess, the, the code I mentioned it from the point of view of asymptotic symmetries. Let me pretend that I already know, say, an asymptotic symmetry. Can I see the soft theorem? That's going to do now. I don't want to ramble too much about other things you could say about why they had to be code to do there. So what I would normally do if I wanted to basically show that asymptotic symmetries equals word identities would normally proceed by quite a few steps. And so Normally, if I think of like charge conservation, I'm thinking about normal like time evolution. So if I'm going to look at the EM case as an example here, um, my canonical charges for a time slice would be at different um, points of I0. So I0 is a bit different than scry plus's past boundary or scry minus's future boundary. And so what we'd want to do is want to look at the, the final state would be something where the um, basically forward evolving in time is basically taking me to a point that looks like it's at the past boundary of scry plus. And similarly, like going with the past evolution, if I push that Cauchy slice down to scry minus, the uh, boundary of that is basically a very, um, the future boundary of scry minus, so scry minus plus. So normally what happens is to show this word identity, you know that there is a asymptotic symmetry, but I wanna make sure that I act on my in and my out states consistently. So I'm looking for this diagonal subgroup that basically is saying I did a transformation, both my in and my out states, and um, that should not do anything to the S matrix. It should just um, basically give me the same thing. So I take my Cauchy slice, I push it to the in state or the out state. I'm evaluating the canonical charges for those very early and late times. Then I need some sort of antipodal matching uh, unless I either have some sort of rule for what happens at spatial infinity, or I assume that there's no nothing funny going on there. And in that context, there's an antipodal matching condition for like say the electric field um, across these two points here. And then I use constraint equations and integrate parts along U to really write the same canonical charges as integrals along um, scry plus or scry minus. And now when I have that, basically I've turned this canonical charge would be like the electric charge at spatial infinity into a flux term where there's a soft part and a hard part. And so on the one hand, the, the word identity here follows from this antipodal matching condition because before I did step six, I had a term that's acting in the in-state and a term that's acting in the out-state, but I can just as well shuffle the soft equals the hard, and that's where I have soft theorems in the standard derivation. 
So now I'm going to take a step back and say, okay, we've talked about this conformal primary basis. And what we've done is we've taken a boost along the direction in which a particle's momentum is and tried to diagonalize that boost. So that conformal dimension for each of these external states is conjugate to the Rindler time evolution. So basically, I could actually think about what would happen if I say I picked my North Pole and I wanted to look at um, what happens if I evolve with a uh, a boost towards the North Pole or, 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 or backwards. So what I have in that context is to be a little bit careful about how those um, the vector field corresponding to a boost is actually chopping up my space time in, in relation to this conformal boundary that I've talked about everything in terms of. So my question for this next part of the talk is, can we see the soft theorem of coordinate and equivalence more immediately starting from a boost evolution picture, which is the natural picture if I'm going to look at scattering with these conformal dimensions um, fixed. So to see how a radial equals Rindler evolution uh, is going to basically be powerful here, let me think about what would happen if I um, basically tried to cut my celestial sphere uh, at the equator and look at a boost evolution that takes me to the North Pole or to the South Pole. So what one can see is if I took in my space time, and so pardon, it looks like I'm looking at r equals zero, but I'm going to eventually have a diagram where I try to show a 3D version of the cut that I'm doing here. I want to cut my space time into left and right halves for now. So I'm just looking at um, x3 equals zero. And so in these coordinates, so I, the coordinates that are adapted to being near scry, which means that u is much smaller than r, doing that cut amounts to basically looking at zz bar. So absolute value of z squared is one. And so that's this equator of the celestial sphere. Now, of course, this is just a co-dimension one slice of the bulk. And so it's still co-dimension one of uh, the boundary because it's not a radial um, direction. And so in that context, I literally am going along one of the generators of scry with this cut. And if I look at a boost image of that, then I know that on the celestial sphere, I should basically have this foliation of the sphere with rings uh, concentric to the axis that goes from the South Pole to the North Pole. And I can do whatever I want. I can map it to a cylinder with an exponential map. Um, but in the bulk, I know that I'm basically taking my Rindler slice that is this out of outside the Rindler wedge x3 equals zero slice and boosting it towards one of the horizons or towards one of the other horizons. And so one, one can keep in mind is the same way that Mobius transformations will map basically circles on the celestial sphere to other circles on the celestial sphere. Um, the thing that I'm sweeping out, if I say that my, my starting point is this hyperplane through the origin of space-time with a certain space-like normal is again now going to be um, basically isomorphic to the space of different uh, directions on this hyperboloid that, uh, of space-like normal um, vectors. So essentially, I have this kind of isomorphism between if I draw a circle in the celestial sphere, I can give you some uh, normal to a, a space-like normal to a hyperplane that corresponds to uh, some cut through my space time that would cut the celestial sphere on the circle and would extend along the generators of scry. And so because, so basically this is the starting point for what I'm gonna talk about next, which is trying to look at the canonical charges on so such slices. So what I wanna do now is I'm saying, when I have a celestial sphere, I've basically already kind of quotiented the in and the out um, spheres, for which I mean, if I have an operator that's sitting at a given point and it has an in or an out label, basically would mean it's at antipodal points on uh, on scry. And so whenever I draw this this ring or some sort of contour on my celestial sphere, I know how I want to basically pin down uh, that contour in terms of antipodal points at the scry plus and scry minus. And now I'm saying that if I have a co-dimension one surface that spans between those two, essentially it's going to be some deformation of what these types of um, hyperplanes that have space like normal um, do my space time look like. So what I'm proposing right now is that I can basically try to lift some contour in the celestial sphere in a manner that basically goes along the generators of scry. Um, and then that the canonical charge is on that co-dimension one surface now. The charge itself is now, again, another co-dimension code goes to the boundary there. That is equal to the symmetry generators that I would write down on the celestial sphere. So what I'm basically saying is I want to just lift the cut up to the bulk but I do so in a way that respects my ability to quotient by the generator of scry. And so the charges that I would have in this like state of like on the circle for the celestial sphere, if I think about it radial evolution wise, should be the same thing I would do if I had this funny cut. And then I talk about comparing, say the state on one circle versus another is like comparing um, 
I guess, boosting the, the surface that I've cut the bulk with or not. But the weird thing now is that that is not a crochet slice anymore. It's like kind of the outside the Rindler wedge, a cut of the- Sabrina, of the you're going too fast. Please slow down. Oh, good. Okay, good. No, no, no. This is good. No, perfect. Yes. I am going too fast and you, you caught me. Great. Okay. So first, do you have any particular question or do you want me to emphasize here what I'm doing? Uh, well, uh, here I I, I, ha I had this uh, I have this confusion that when you are saying that you have x mu equal to u plus r r r is a yeah. small parameter, right? I mean, you're, no, you're r is large. Parameterizing, you're parameterizing the, parameterizing the entire space time, or are you parameterizing yes. the uh, space time near the sky plus? I'm so I'm parameterizing the entire space time, and I go near sky plus. R is supposed to be much larger than you, so there's a sense in which basically I'm kind of like u is treated as infinitesimal compared to r for most of scry here. So the standard order of limits that I needed for my saddle point approximation, for instance, was that I leave u fixed and take r to infinity, and that r to infinity basically localize this um, point for the momentum to align with the, the point in the celestial sphere. So r is large. So, but what I'm saying is when I do this cut, I don't need to um, only be near the boundary. So basically taking this cut and taking r large is going to be co-dimension two and that's going to take me to um the same this this boundary of the of this of this hypersurface but in this actual hypersurface i am just taking uh x3 to be zero and if i wanted to go to scry i would take r large and have u finite until i and if i took u to be large two i would basically be going either to uh time like infinity or spatial infinity depending on um the sign is that is that part clear now or well, the parameterization is like uh, if you had, uh, instead of momenta, you're just replacing the momenta by the x mu, right? The parameterizations are the yeah. sort of similar. So I, I would suppose that uh, the x mu square, x, x square is zero, right? Is no, 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 x squared is ur. So it's in this limit, x, sorry. So that's a funny thing about it. And what I want to say, which is kind of cute, there's this paper that I have with Sebastian where we are looking at hyperplanes and momentum space, and literally that same type of manipulation is what, um, like to the good intuition with the circles before then jumping to the space time picture in the space time picture i want you gives me a non-trivial x squared so x squared is basically like like two u times r plus u or something i get my guess sometimes i get the sign wrong there um depending on the convention so i think there's a negative sign up front um in that context so right so like basically i agree with you that the order of limits looks like if i actually try to plot this like these surfaces on like a, in, in mathatica then basically whatever cutoff I want to implement, um, I think you're, you'll see that the story near um, u equals zero is like kind of the easiest one to, to picture. But strictly speaking, you're taking r to infinity first and you're doing that even at the level of here. So when I have this delta function, I've taken r to infinity first. So the order of limits that I say the celestial amplitudes are, are basically using is r goes to infinity first. And the fact that I can do that is related to the radiative phase space. And then I still have this full U direction that I'm Fourier transforming along. And so I agree that in a finite coordinate patch, there's something funny about how that pushes that like going along U versus infinite time is a little bit um, distorted here. But strictly speaking, I should be Argos infinity and then I have a full real line of U. And in that same sense, I have this here where I still have um, basically, if I, if I took a, say I look at a different boost family. So I look at, um, Essentially, uh, instead of x3 equals zero, I look at some like uh, other Rindler slice. So like x0 and x3, I have some linear relation. Then I would see that at lar leading order in large R, that slope is just a different value of absolute value of c squared. But now, of course, you write that, like, strictly speaking, I, I don't just have that. I have another term there. So I'd have u plus something. So what one would do is that I can still solve for u as a function of absolute value of z squared. So I, um, so, so what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that I know I want to quote dimension one surface and I could still solve for X zero plus like, X, like cosine alpha X zero plus like sine alpha X three equals zero. Now is a surface where U is a function of R and absolute value of Z. And then in the large R limit, I still limit to the circle on the sphere so that everything should be fine as far as like, I'm not, I don't want to like pull anything over anybody with like the, the, um, like the the this picture of the the what it looks like in the light cone and extending that to the scry, but strictly speaking, I should be able to see that without, um, like I don't need to match every order in R. I can literally solve for you 
this, this type or surface, u as a function of zz bar and r, um, or, or base, vice versa, and basically see that as I go to the large r limit, I kind of localize on, uh, the surface should localize on the social screen extend along u. So hopefully that hypersurface picture is fine, um, but I agree that it's basically like the, the value u equals zero is the cleanest one to see these, these cuts of the circle. So is, is that cool? So is the parameterization apart from the u? Suppose you, you drop the u in that parameterization. Right? It, that's what the, the, if you drop the u for sure, I, it's, it's clear to see that you have the circles and you're fine. But the question yeah. is, again, there's an extra dimension to that surface. And so the fact that it extends in u uh, is easiest to see for this x3 equals zero slice, just because you're going all time, basically. It's a, it's a sort of a funny coordinate system anyway, go ahead. Yeah, you know, it is. And, but, but I would say that that funniness is still there even at the level of the, the like localization on the, celestial, uh, on the celestial sphere with these saddle point approximations. Like you're using that large R first to get this delta function in, 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 the, in the Z coordinates. Um, but, but I'm well more than happy to say, just like look at this hypersurface with this normal and look at the canonical charge on it. And you're gonna have contributions from I zero and I plus and I minus. So you don't need to just resolve uh, the contribution from scribe plus and scribe minus unless one wants to compare it to um, these soft theorem things. So is that fine or we can, I'm happy to, to debate this more to make sure that we- No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 that's fine. But it should, it should be fine. So yeah, so basically, the cute trick is to solve for some other surface, and then you see that you have this linear relation between u, r, z, and z bar. And so, yeah, sorry, I think I said that I would solve for u in terms of the thing. I would, the better thing, sorry, is to solve for absolute value of z squared in terms of u and r, and then you would see that in the large uh, r limit, it has to be um, basically this one circle. So that's that's the the, the right phrasing of that. Okay. Good. Okay, so now that I basically, and I'm, I'm more than happy to debate that cut because that's <laughs> that's the clear thing that I was like, like bothered myself too. It's like, okay, I have this intuition for momentum space. This works. It seems to lift here, and I have the saddle point approximation. And so, um, yeah, happy to to debate that it checks out, but I think it does. And so the fun thing is when it does check out like that. Now, if I give you an asymptotic symmetry and I give you a um, basically the gauge transformation that I want to do. Okay, so now I'm going to jump to the canonical charge given to me by someone who told me I have a gauge theory, so I know the, the two form. And I also know that lambda that I want is going to be a function of the celestial sphere. So not to, to make sure that I'm not saying that I'm un undermining every like the whole derivation that Andy did, there's a little bit of insight still here that basically in this quotienting that I'm saying that I can do from the point of view of um, going from the slice of the bulk down like to lift this contour on the celestial sphere, I basically already tried to identify the in and out celestial spheres. So any function of this celestial sphere that I want to use for my symmetry parameter, I would want to basically be antipodally matched. So there's a little bit of sense in which you can see that, but strictly speaking, the fact that that's a symmetry and that's the right thing to do, I would say still um, like grateful to Andy and the people who showed the antipodal matching that that's a, the good choice of a synthetic symmetry generator with this antipodal matching here. But I think there's a way to move around it, but let's ignore that for now. Someone gave me the asymptotic charges and the fact that this lambda is now basically at near scry or near scry plus or scry minus is this function of the angle um, with standard photo matching. Now, for yeah, ordinary I, I questions- just, I just want to yeah. press, press something again, yeah. because uh, I, I suppose uh, the parameterized parameterization that you're using for yes. X mu uh, yes. is actually, uh, uh, if, if apart from the U, yeah. If it was if it was exactly similar to what you have for p mu, then I would yes. suppose it, it just it just parameterizes scry plus because scry plus is precisely uh, a, a surface which obeys x square equal to zero. Isn't that correct? So, so, no, no, so, so scry plus. No, 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 no. I would say um, I wouldn't say it that way. Okay, what I would say is that the difference between um, scry minus and scry plus is basically the sign of r here. And so what it amounts to is if I did the exact same thing at scry minus. I would be at a different point in the space time, but I would have basically the antipodal points. And so that's also consistent with the picture of um, boosting, like basically the way that this hypersurface intersects the generators would be in a matter where I, I kind of go in opposite ways for, for the in and out. But I would, so basically the surface of large X squared, um, 
if, I, if, I'm, if I, u not equal to zero, then the conformal boundary has x squared being large. Um, but because again, u equals zero is still because, x squared. Because zero. just tri plus is essentially yeah. along a light uh, light cone, right? I mean, it's a light cone of a of a of the point at spatial infinity. I guess so it's it's really not like yeah, the, so the, the celestial sphere is the intersection of two light cones, though. So so what happens is that this basically, if I take u equals zero and r goes to infinity, then I'm at the intersection of the light cone, which is sky, and the light cone, which is the light cone of the origin. And so I think that that the fact that those two are intersecting at the same point where everything is easier to see is is the is the um is the 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 miss the a possible um conflation of the two here but i wouldn't say that if i set u equals zero that that's um oh yeah so it's because because if u equals zero are positive then it's it's like the future it, it gives me the future sphere and then if r were like negative i'd get the past like there's still a like the light cone of the origin still has two disconnected components and so that you have in and out but um because on the sorry, light sorry, 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 some data. Uh, yeah. Perhaps we can leave the discussion for the end. Okay. Because I'm, I'm not sure it's going to benefit everyone, but okay, oh, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. To continue, feel free. Yeah, great. And I'm happy to also point you to um, yeah these these hypersurfaces and hyper and circles play a nice role uh, in, the, in the in and out thing. I agree with you that basically um, there is a sense in which a light cone in space time is isomorphic to a light cone in momentum space, especially for some of the celestial like the Poincaré invariance picture, but um, it's not. I think one should be wary about doing um, too much of it. like the light cone versus the light cone of spatial infinity is quite a different beast because you're at infinity. But okay, so but I'm happy to talk at the end in more detail, and I think that we can resolve this because I don't see anything um, getting away. It's just a matter of um, how it's helpful or not. Okay, so I have now my canonical charge for this function of the celestial sphere. So basically, I say that my gauge parameter is. Um, Basically, if in harmonic gauge, it solves the harmonic equations of motion. Um, so it's like box lambda equals zero. And then there's some data, which is this data on the celestial sphere, which determines the, the solution in the bulk. Now, if I cut my space time on a normal Cauchy slice, then that co-dimension two boundary of, so the boundary of that Cauchy slice is going to be um, some time slice of, of spatial infinity, which will be some S2, where the value of that uh, gauge field, sorry, like so the F U R that I oh, sorry, F mu nu that I have as this canonical charge uh, pulled back to that co-dimension two surface um, here is basically so remember I'm taking star k uh, is F R U. If I do the same thing, but now with this um, region corresponding to the sky plus or sky minus of my other cut, my hyperplane cut, then what I get is like, the radiated components. So this is literally just coming from pulling back to basically uh, the, something that spans the U direction and then the Z, so a contour on the sphere. So the good thing about that is already I see that instead of going from the electric charge at inf like at spatial infinity, so this like kind of pillbox type picture that I'd have for Gauss's law, I have instead radiative components of the field because of the way that this slice cuts the boundary. So I already see that at the level of evaluating the canonical charges on those slice, it's related to the soft theorems. And so then if I do the same manipulations to try to say, kind of take my slice that it would normally go um, through this hypersurface deform it so that I'm only looking at boundary contributions. Uh, so basically I'm taking my hypersurface of the origin and kind of pushing it out to the boundary in a way um, that kind of respects the, the fact that I wanted to cap off one hemisphere or the other hemisphere of the social sphere. I can glue it back together. And so what I'm saying is in the same way that for the standard board identity, I would take basically my in surface and my out surface the canonical charges were originally at the like the spatial infinity boundaries of those surface basically but i could write them in terms of flux laws along with full set of scry i'm doing the same thing but i'm just dividing up how i would look at that full union of two three manifolds so in some sense normally what i would do is in the um standard picture you have it in versus out versus in the celestial picture it's basically one side of the um equator versus the other side of the equator. So there's like a north and a south pole. And so instead of being left and right from the bulk space time, that's basically um, the like what you would get if you boost evolve towards like the one Rindler horizon versus the other Rindler horizon. So, so, sorry, Sabrina, I'm, I'm, just yeah. I'm just getting oh, yeah. really confused. So I, so I, should, yeah. I should ask. Yeah, definitely. Sorry. 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, this might be so. So, are you saying that that you can you can write the Gauss law by doing an integral not on a slice of spatial infinity but along some other slice? Is that the yes, thing? yes, yes. Sorry, I, I'm I'm confused about that. Is is this, I mean um, uh, that's just some statement in electromagnetism that we can there's conservation of charge along some slice which cuts both scry plus and scry minus. Or, uh, sorry. So so it shouldn't be conservation law. Sorry, what I'm trying to say is that so long as I understand that cut. The thing that I'm still doing is still taking two surfaces that have the same dr. Sorry, sorry. So like the um, I'm not actually looking at conservation in the same way that I would look at conservation. Like, sorry, in Andy's picture, you need literal charge conservation between infinite past time and future past time in order to do the antipodal matching. But at the level of the antipodal matching, like it's almost like you're you're sorry. So if I had just taken a given time slice then I wouldn't have any issue with a conservation law. I would just need the fact that that co-dimension two boundary is the same for the set of surfaces. So what I'm saying here is that I take my co-dimension two boundary to be this funny like boundary of a hypersurface in my space time. And then I look at two surfaces that span that, that still skirt scry. If I wanted to write down the full soft equals hard word identity. So there's nothing, there's no sense in which charge has to be conserved in the sense of like different um, circles on the social sphere could enclose different charge operators, right? But the conservation law still follows from the same way that I can deform um, my surface through the bulk to have the same boundary. And that boundary for me now is this ring on the celestial sphere. I see. So, and, and what you, and the, the thing about, so see, and you don't have to worry about the fact that the things might leak out of a null infinity. You don't have to worry about boundary conditions on null infinity when you do this deformation in the bulk. Yes, and that's, so this is part of the, that's just why, this is what I think is the benefit. I agree that you have to, you, you, you basically will enclose some operators or not. So basically if I change my, my circle, I like, right, sometimes you have an operator inside of it, sometimes you don't if I look at a particular configuration. But um, basically, yes, that's, that's what I'm saying is the benefit is like, I'm kind of including in and out together in this picture instead of what you would have, which is this U evolution. This is exactly the type of comparison I'm going to make. But this is why I'm happy. I'm like, I'm not, I don't mind some of those questions because like, to me, like, like that's the interesting thing. And I'm like, I'm like, it's a solo paper. So I don't have like, I bounce it off as many people as like, I've talked to. So I'm happy to like, make sure this is like- I see, I see. Okay, okay, thank but, you. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm understanding better. Thank you, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great. I'm happy. And I'm, I want you to understand this because yeah, sorry, sorry, yes. Thank you. Definitely tear me apart. Like, I, I, hope, I hope it survived by now, <laughs> but I'm happy. So this is great. Okay, so now basically what I'm so doing is- So is understanding that there is a flux uh, both coming inside from the scry minus and going outside the scry plus, and we, you have to so, find out- So we, in this particular picture that I've done right here to write the word identity, I have done something which is kind of not, not cheating so much, but it's the same way that I deform, in the same way that I would deform a T equals zero Cauchy slice up to scry plus, I've now in this slide taken my hypersurface of the bulk and pushed it in a way so that it kind of cuts across the, the bulk space time in the, the, the circle here. But really all the interesting data is happening at scry. So um, strictly speaking, again, if I had this antipodal matching condition, then I could strictly speaking, literally identify some points here with points here. And it would be like, I'm just like chopping up the boundary in a different way, but there is a little bit of a subtlety with what I'm saying is I, okay, yeah, I, I'm not saying that there can't be, uh, like if I looked at the hypersurface, I'm not saying that Gauss's law looks as clean on that particular hypersurface as it does on this deformation of that surface so that it hugs a boundary, I guess is, is what I'm, I, I want to just have that caveat there. But at the level of the manipulation of um, say one Rindler time versus another, so like one ring here versus another ring here, you can see that from the way that these uh, hypersurfaces intersect uh, the generators of the screen. So that's, okay. So hopefully I didn't confuse you with that caveat answer, but basically, are you are you happy for, for me moving on to some data or? or... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, good, good. Okay, so I think I think Subrat understands, or like, yeah, so some data you're asking really good questions as far as making sure that I am not doing something like too quickly. Um, but I think that's good. I wanted to make sure because I think this is an interesting point here. And then I think that Subrat knows what I was trying to do. So hopefully in the end we can agree that I that it's okay to do. Um, but basically, so what I'm saying is Gauss's law on this funny surface, there, there is a sense in which, yeah, basically, right, 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 right how do I want to say, I want to say this better. Okay, so, so what, what I do want to say is that in the same way that Gauss's law is saying something about the, the slice of the bulk given the, the, the data at the boundary. So from the strict point of view of, if I have like this T equals zero slice in this kind of pillbox picture, 
Gauss's law is saying something about the electric field that I measure at infinity is telling me something about the charge configuration in the middle. So the same thing is strictly speaking, I guess, happening from the point of view of that still the, the boundary of the surface now is the soft theorem. So the thing that I'm measuring instead of the electric field at infinity is the soft theorem. But I guess the way that one would interpret the, the charge matter on that slice can depend on how the slice is spanning. Like, so if it's a t equals zero slice or some other weird uh, surface that spans that same boundary. So that, I guess that's the only caveat about being too quick with this statement that I think is kind of cute, but we do want to caveat that. And then now to go to the currents for the celestial CFT, one does one extra little trick, but I think, and what I like about this picture is that this one makes more sense in the sense of I'm doing a gauge transformation with lambda versus if I wanted to only change one helicity sector uh, versus the other, you can do two things in the celestial CFT. One of them doesn't look good from my point of view. And so my perspective is that I didn't want to have to smear anything in the celestial sphere. So I can really say that an operator is on one side or the other. And this picture works best for this Mellon transform no shadow thing going on. So what I want to point out is if I put in a pole for this choice of lambda, then I would normally have two contributions. One of them would be the shadow of the thing. So no matter what, I can still use this, this formula and I'm generating the transformation of the thing, but this doesn't pick out necessarily only one helicity contribution unless I do a certain trick where the soft theorem uh, of one helicity sector smeared with the shadow kernel equals the soft theorem for the other helicity sector. So you okay, can so do really that. I'm confused yeah. by something. Yeah. Gauss, Gauss law usually applies for electrostatics, right? I mean, uh, you, you are you, so, assuming, you, you assuming the dynamic dynamical form of the Gauss uh, law? Uh, I would say, okay, so maybe when you, when you say Gauss law, okay, I, I think I'm taking the constraint equations to be Gauss law. So this is a kind of a little bit of a bastardization of maybe what I mean by Gauss law. Um, but no, like, no, you still have, sorry. No, 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 no. I, I, so I, I take Gauss law to be the fact that I know that F, that this Q is the charge. So in, in the same sense that, um, right, when I say this is electromagnetic charge, I'm saying that that's like the, the charge of the state. So like, I wouldn't have a non-zero F R U term if I didn't have some charge matter in the bulk. Um, so it's, it's in that sense. Like I, that doesn't involve electrostatics to still interpret the action on the in and out states of, of this gauge field. Sorry. Yeah. So, in, in general, when you have scattering, you have yeah. in and out states. I mean, you have yeah. uh, you have photons coming in and going out. Sure, sure. But I still have like the bonding mass of the system. So I'm saying in the, in the same sense the, that the bonding mass is reflective of the matter, like the, I guess I mean, gravity is a little bit messed up, but in the ENM case, the fact that FRU is non-zero at this order in one over R squared is a statement about the fact that there's charges in the system. And if I had a bunch of boosted charges, they're gonna basically change the angle dependence of this profile, but this integral, if I had lambda equals a constant, I would measure literally the electric charge. So I agree with you that the statement, I guess, of like the fact that I know the total net charge and I have the spherical symmetric configuration and some like the impact, like the, everything's close enough to the origin, like that value as a function of the angle is um, some statement about electrostatics. So, so in this Q plus expression, you're using a continuity uh, equation to uh, write the integral in from, you're you are getting this expression from the continuity equation? So, so, so what, what, when I say Gauss law, I kind of am meaning that the, 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 the okay, I'm because, basically. Uh, but, uh, okay. But, but when you have, so, when you have time dependent fields. Yes, you, you have a, you, but you have constraint you, equations still. You still have? You you have constraint equations still, so maybe when I think of Gauss's law, I'm I'm being a little bit glib with the fact that, um, like Gauss's law follows from the constraint equations, and the constraint equations generally imply like relations between the radiative fields and the matter fields. So to me, I kind of interpret the soft theorem equals hard as like a Gauss's. It's basically it's coming from the same constraint equations that one would have, but I agree that if you want to say Gauss's law only applies in electrostatics, and then we could argue about that, and maybe I would tone down the way that I phrase that. But otherwise, I would say that, um, like the analog of of like of Gauss's law is this relation between soft and hard fluxes. It's great because they're both coming from gauge invariance. Okay, just go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think part of it's semantics, but but okay, there's one. So in the paper, I have a little bit of a nice picture where, um, I guess I'm looking at something where there's a a surface. Uh, sorry, like. Basically, it's identity on some inside the contour and, and zero outside, and seeing if I can um, basically pick up the profile such that I match the thing. But it's it's been a while since I wrote that down, so I don't have it on the slides. Um, so okay, so basically now, what I'm saying is that I can write down the celestial currents 
in two ways. Either one way is the current that's holomorphic and there's no other, the piece um, basically comes from a particular choice of lambda, where there's a pole. And one can see in this manipulation that whenever there's a pole here, basically there's a soft contribution, even in this um, two parts combined, so that it should be zero. Um, and the, sec or the, the, the second way one can pick out a single holicity is to basically look at the dual transformation. So those don't have a nice like gauge field interpretation, but the canonical charges, again, were a function of the fluxes. And so I can write down the dual charge so, and um, in, in doing so, pick out the single holicity modes for 4D. Okay, so hopefully um, I've, I'm happy with the debates because this is good because it, it basically makes sure these things are solid and or that I'm not talking too quickly too. So thank you very much for that. Um, but basically now the radial equals radial evolution picture basically let us see that we can jump from um, looking at like cutting the space time in terms of uh, constant Rindler time cuts, but Rindler time outside of the Rindler wedges. Um, and that let us see that the basically soft operators in the bulk would, base, would be connected to these asymptotic symmetries. Basically also we saw that there's a sense in which this co-dimension two hologram is the more familiar uh, thing given that caveat, because in this sense, basically the, the way that we were cutting the bulk in the boundary naturally quotiented by the generators of scry. And so we still have this expression, like we're taking the canonical charge in the bulk equal to some symmetry in the, in the boundary, but we've basically removed an extra direction in a way that's consistent with that. So that's good because basically if you have anything built up from ADS CFT intuition, um, you can try to like pull it or like generalize it to this way that I'm slicing the bulk and boundary, or you can even say that I don't like this way of slicing the bulk and boundary. And I'm, I'm happy with that. Like if, if people like say that maybe it's better to do what Subrab is doing, which is like, we can't you cut switch, I'm gonna go to next. So, can we further see that this basis is a better way to present the flat space hologram? And so that's gonna be the thing that I'm gonna to try to pitch now, but I wanna now emphasize kind of the distinction between what I'm trying to present here, which is what Suvrat has looked at, and sorry, and I look and other sites, so the collaborators, the paper, <laughs> I'm remembering Suvrat's name, but I'm sure that there are other collaborators here that I'm accidentally not saying their names. Um, we've emphasized in the Slusser program is looking at Rindler evolution of the Vulcan boundary. Um, so these kind of cuts to the space time and then boost images of this like canonical X3 zero cut for this particular choice. So, in this case, I've showed some of the benefits for that soft theorems were the canonical charges, basically, that I get the in and out contributions by nature of the fact that this cut is going through the space time. Um, and then the next thing that is going to be like the interesting thing about this, how far can we push the Rindler evolution uh, picture would be that there's a sense in which maybe we could see these W infinity uh, tower of symmetries better. So this is what I'm going to close on. Um, and then again, this is hopefully there's room for, for discussion in this case. So I just want to contrast that. Well, first of all, okay, so I didn't draw one foliation, which is time evolution. So normally momentum space, I pick that because I'm basically looking at translation um, eigenstates first of all. And in that context, if I look at just normal time evolution, all of my slices would end at uh, spatial infinity. And so essentially, unless I'm looking at the behavior of the fields in some resolution of I0, then um, kind of from the point of view of scry, time evolution looks not as cool because I guess like normal time evolution, uh, the boundaries of those surfaces are still going to be um, at uh, spatial infinity. So kind of not intersecting scrying. Now, when it comes to thinking of um, kind of evolution along the boundary of these correlators, I think one nice thing to do is to do what um, this like holographic um, nature of null infinity paper is doing. Um, and also is related to what Corollian people are doing, which is that instead of so I basically had this fact that this plane waves look like they're smeared along generators of scry. I could have basically Fourier transformed back in the U coordinate to put operators at points along scry. So I can literally think of correlators of, of operators along scry plus or scry minus. And that correlation function should be some Fourier transform of the S matrix. So it should be equivalent in that sense. Um, but in this other context, now I can basically think of basically evolution along U. So I want to think about using, say, like the ADM Hamilton, or maybe the Bondi version of that, because I don't want to be at, at spatial infinity. But I can think about like the, the canonical charges here and evolving in U. In that context, I have these issues of basically charge non-conservation. And so this is the statement about like whether the data at I0 is enough and, and what, what you lose when you go along U. Um, this time coordinate is null, so it's a bit different. But Carolian people have a pretty good handle, I think, on that. And then the connecting in and out is a bit weird. So from the point of view of just having data at I0, I guess you're, you're safer here. But if you really want to I guess, look at these correlation functions 
thinking of them in terms of these two boundary components is a little bit unnatural to basically have to evolve and you cause to leave in those kind of this null direction. And then suddenly no how to antipodally match across here. I think that's that that's how the problem's a little bit weird. Um, and strictly speaking, trying to think about embedding this in some like larger ADS and looking at a bulk, this is a bulk point of something. So basically, I think that there, there's different ways of understanding the spot space hologram. And I want to advocate for like just comparing the different ways and not saying that one is necessarily better yet. And then trying to make the pitch for why Celestial has a, some advantages is like the next part of the talk. But I'm more than happy to basically take one takeaway is basically seeing how we're cutting the bulk and boundary differently, because that should kind of show what what what's what's neat about celestial or whatnot so that's that's one takeaway um now i want to point out that these different bases for scattering um are natural for various reasons so if i look at this u picture I, that's what i started from when i started to talk about the asymptotic uh, phase space uh, of gravity so it's useful for understanding when i want to go from the, the the bulk to the boundary or vice versa this picture of like recursively solving my equations of motion into the bulk is easier to do in position space identifying the asymptotic symmetry group at least for the actual like asymptotic symmetries that I know are good, and same thing for memory effects. But the one question one has is, okay, say someone says there's another subleading soft theorem. There's like another subleading, soft, whatever. Like however many theorems, it's like soft theorems you're going to have, which should be occurring to the IR triangle. Like there should be um, aesthetic symmetry interpretations. That's kind of hard to add in by hand without basically undoing everything you've just set up. So so that's the kind of the negative of this viewing the IR triangle from the position basis is okay. You tell me there's another soft theorem, that's great, but now how do I, like, what do I have to give up to see a larger asymptotic symmetry group? And the fact that there's this kind of flexibility in what I'm gauge, like what my gauge choice is, and then I should still see the same asymptotic symmetry group, like there's some questions there that are kind of like, mm, not fun. Do I want to add, for instance, overleading in our um, pure gauge directions to my face space, just for the sake of their canonical conjugates being some, subleading our like multiple moments that I can pick up now and measure. Like that seems like a kind of drastic thing to do, to augment your face space with a direction that's supposed to be pure gauge anyway. Like, but people have proposed that. And so this does interplay, I just want to emphasize this kind of a downside of the position space picture. It's not always clear to see why the asymptotic symmetries are physical. Now in momentum space, one thing nice about having that asymptotic symmetry story is that you have a reason, like these word identities, to believe that these soft theorems have a universal form. But when it comes to basically identifying the soft theorems, like Kachazo and Strominger found the subleading soft theorem before they found the asymptotic symmetry. So there's clearly a benefit to being in momentum space and understanding how the amplitudes behaved in soft and collinear limits. Now, if I go to celestial basis, any information I have about soft theorems, I can convert into information about the analytic structure, or by which I mean the residues here, maybe not the full, like, like more statements about analyticity in, in delta, of the celestial amplitude. So the factorizations, uh, this coming off of Chung, Guevara, Pate, and others, um, the factorizations that happen at certain orders in omega turn into poles at different integer values of delta. So they get separated out uh, to behavior at different points in this complex delta plane uh, for these guys. Now, if I take a very strictly speaking radial evolution perspective again, then maybe what I would try to do is um, look for the null states in, in this theory. Now, I have to be careful that being a primary descendant doesn't automatically mean that you're in null state, at least a priori from the way that the uh, Hermitian conjugation works from the point of view of the 40 Hilbert space, as opposed to these kind of state operator BPZ inner products that like Andy and friends have tried to develop uh, maybe like a year ago. But let's at least just look at the representation theory for one moment. This is gonna be kind of part of the punchline is that I stress that Rindler evolution and like the techniques of radial evolution in the celestial CFT seem to be getting more than uh, maybe one would expect them to deserve to get. And so if I strictly speaking then start to do what I would do in the 2D CFT context, the beauty of the fact that the hologram is an extra dimension basically is that I have this tunability in delta. And so rather than ask the question of like, okay, I have this special um, special spectrum for my theory where I now have these like primary descendants that decouple, I can choose to go to those values of delta. And so because this celestial CFT has this, this is secretly a 3D theory, that continuous spectrum of delta lets me tune delta to any value where there are primary descendants. And so the interesting thing about it is that from the point of view of the soft theorem, it seems like these primary descendants actually decouple. So I get something close to these operator equations where the primary descendants at this bottom, like, so you've taken after derivatives, they actually vanish in correlators. And so then what I see, first of all, is a whole tower of special values of the conformal dimension. And then I know that those would correspond to say the modes of um, in a soft expansion 
now I want to emphasize that so basically it's pointing me to this tower of soft modes as being something that's interesting and might have this decoupling type of situation for the celestial theory. It doesn't tell me that the soft theorem has a universal form. So it's not like it's necessarily reading off for you a bunch of soft factors, but it is basically saying if you wanted to try to evaluate what the soft factors would be, you want it to be a Green's function for a certain number of derivatives in this uh, the coordinate that Q depends on. And you want it to have a certain conformal dimension. So I think one could try to use this type of exercise to write down the class of terms that you can get for these soft theorems. And maybe implicitly has been done, um, but maybe not explicitly phrased that way uh, in some of the papers looking at like maybe Prahar and others. I, I would have to look back to see if they were implicitly doing that. But the beautiful you thing about it now. The previous yeah. Slide? yeah. Previous. Yeah. So here uh, is the understanding that that the last term in the bracket yeah is that exhaustive or are there are other no that's what the thing is as a, okay so with freddie and it's and Strom, so Kuchazo and Stromunder, they had a sub subleading soft graviton theorem in the same way they, they had a subleading e and m case and so basically this this the second paper in the the two that i was going to talk about was trying to play around with them the most subleading soft theorems that freddie and, and andy found now, that's like the first in the full tower of these W infinity symmetries that they're playing with now. Um, but it's precisely because of this tension between I don't have a known asymptotic symmetry. There have been some proposals for it that are basically like overleading diffeomorphisms or overleading gauge transformations. And that is in tension with basically this delicate balance that we have between physical fall offs and the symmetries that we thought we found a while back um, that makes it part of the reason why the social basis is interesting is that basically you can kind of. Um, see how the thing that's universal isn't the fact, like, sorry. So let me do one other thing that I guess I didn't put on the slides here. When it comes to these asymptotic symmetries, like the super translations and super rotations, the act of going to a conformal primary wave function is effectively like gauge fixing. And that there is a representative of those um, gauge fixed just profiles that are pure gauge. So what I mean to say, sorry, if I take delta equals zero or delta equals one, the wave function that I would have that transforms covariantly in this in this manner is actually pure gauge. And so it's beautiful there because you can see how does this pure gauge solution fall for R? And you can match it to a super translation or super rotation. Conformal primary gauge fixing does not give me more pure gauge wave functions at like integer values of delta. So there's this tension already between the fact like, are there like in this gauge fixing that I do to say I'm going to this conformal primary wave function basis, I don't seem to have more asymptotic symmetries. In the same way that if I use my position space picture, and try to say that like I've imposed physical fall off so that things that are overleading are just removed already. I wouldn't necessarily see extra symmetries corresponding to um, different moments of the of the gauge field in in you basically. So what what's interesting about the celestial perspective is it's trying to just organizing everything in terms of representations of SL two C, and then pointing out that there are these primary descendancy, uh, the, the primary descendants that can occur for certain values in formal dimension. And the question is is like what's what are those equal to? So I think if you broke down the equations of motion into uh, definite weight operators, kind of like Barnich and I guess Rizzoconi and Donay now are starting to do, um, then one could kind of kind of look at the equations at each order in the those like multiplets, I guess, um, and then see if a primary descendant equals something that's like local on the social sphere, so only stretched by hard operators, or it's zero or, or vice versa. So the, the thing that the celestial basis tells you is that that whole tower of soft theorems uh, the, the organizing principle would be that it's this special values of conformal dimension where there are possible decouplings or shortened multiplets, rather than the statement that I know an asymptotic symmetry interpretation or I know a soft theorem that's universal. So I think that's nice because it, what it gives you then is it makes you look the primary descendancy conditions, and I think this is part of the motivation for for Andy's program too. So they don't want to just take take credit for that part. So and the, at, and this program was involved with the sub sub leading uh, corrections. So, 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 so when, when I say any program, right now, I meant I, I should have said that the, the recent papers where Andy finds a W infinity algebra and those, those holographic symmetry algebras already do kind of start from looking at shortened multiples. So, like, I don't want to um, say that they wouldn't have seen this and that this is why they have these. Like, so, so, I think they are seeing this too, but I'm just biased towards the way that I would present it, which is that I was worried about the next sub leading soft terms and whether there's asymptotic symmetry interpretation for those. And it seems like the way that that guy fits into this picture is to look at the primary descendants and then why not go for the full tower? And that's exactly where you have this closure of the OPE algebra that, that they find for this W infinity. So 
Yeah. So the only thing I meant to say, Andy's program, I meant to say that I'm emphasizing that my my take on what he's doing versus like he probably had some of these insights in parallel or before for, for this W infinity. Um, where basically the thing that they're looking at here is they're looking at collinear limits. So they're looking at the OPE of two gravitons or two gluons or, or like any I guess combination. And then they're trying to basically see that if I, I take those complexified collinear limits and define a radial um, ordered commutator between them. So basically this is like a contour integral in, in, um, in like Z12, leaving Z bar 1, 2 fixed. Then I seem to get a symmetry algebra that kind of closes on, on these residues here that are like particular um, integer. So basically this full tower of special values of, of K and K bar that give me um, primary descendants are these residues that are um, basically the delta equals this integer or negative integer values here. And so he mode decomposes them into these W infinity guys, which obey this LW infinity wedge, one plus W infinity uh, wedge symmetry. Um, so basically what I'm saying is, is that their point of view is they look at this kind of celestial OPE and see where these poles appear um, and that the residues of the poles have some closed symmetry algebra and the symmetry algebra is much larger than the, um, the asymptotic symmetry algebra that we're used to. And so what I want to point out is there's two, two kinds of infinite symmetries. And so the first infinite symmetry is basically like thinking of the fact that if I have some monopoles and I boost them in different directions, then I have an angle dependence to the, 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 the gauge field and infinity that gives me like an angle dependent conservation law. So that infinity is basically like spherical harmonics versus this infinity is like orders in R. And so just so we see what we're spanning basically two, like the kind of the beginning of the program and the recent stuff in the program are these two different notions of infinite numbers of symmetries. And the beautiful thing about it is hopefully like the, like the first paper that I was presenting today shows that even the first one can benefit from viewing things in terms of a radially evolving celestial CFT. And clearly the last one is basically rooted in looking at the conformal dimensions corresponding to like shortened multiplets in, uh, in a 2D CFT. And so I guess, Part of this talk is like that kind of the last part with these extra symmetry algebras is maybe a, even more motivation for um, how the celestial basis maybe picks out things you wouldn't see from other cuts of the space time. But emphasizing again that even the starting point of the program can benefit from, from taking this like Rindler evolution seriously. So this is all I wanted to say for the, for the talk today. The advantage of this program is we're reorganizing scattering in terms of symmetries. And there's two types of infinite number of symmetries. This infinite dimensional enhancement we get from the asymptotic symmetry group, which really motivated the story in terms of the stress sensor being there, so then going to the boost basis. But also these sets of symmetries we get if we look at all conformally soft modes, which basically are looking for like flux relations at like subleading orders in R if there are any. These additional symmetries should put interesting constraints in the S matrix. One can ask what uh, interaction terms preserve certain, um, certain OP algebras that they find if it closes or whatnot. Um, and then the Point of this talk is to emphasize how this radial quantization perspective are playing a crucial role in each case. And that's part of a pitch for how we're slicing the bulk and boundary as compared to other cuts. So thank you guys for your time and your questions. Um, happy to answer more questions or, or actually talk as long as you guys want to for. Okay, thank you Sabrina for the great talk. So are there more questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yes. So yeah, if I understood correctly, you know, one one of the, the punchlines you had was you take some other arbitrary uh, 3D slice and then yeah. uh, you can compute this charge, which corresponds to some charge uh, of a, for a contour in the yeah. celestial CFT, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what about massive particles? So massive particles go to I plus or I minus. So yeah. uh, uh, I mean, is there some way you can include or exclude some insertions of massive particles or are they always just always included? Yeah, so, so that's I, so I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, okay, so, so I think that my picture of a slicing through the space time will still work when there's behavior at at at, at uh, i plus and i minus because in that context I just need to be careful about the contributions there. If that makes sense, like right, like the like like the, the surface still intersects like that hyperboloid resolving i plus in in some way, right? It, it should cut that. So I think that wait, does it have to cut that? It might. I mean, it might not cut that at all, right? It might end I think up. It I think so. X three equals zero cuts everything. It cuts spatial infinity. It cuts time like in, it cuts time like infinity too. So I'm just thinking about at least the the canonical cut is this X three equals zero cut, and it should include. Um, the, the question is whether there's the measure like if it matters. If like you know what I mean. Um, I think it, it counts. It should count in the same way that the um, fur term that was there at spatial infinity also would be like the boundary limit of. Uh, 
Oh, sorry, sorry. Did you, did, was it was it important for you that you took the x3 equal to zero cut? I thought you had a general no, story. No, no. I, can take, I, I can take any. I take any cut. But what I'm saying is that the x3 equals zero cut makes it clearer to see that like I'm not by doing that cut, I'm not like getting rid of time like infinity or or space like infinity. It, 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 in the following sense. So what what I'm saying is if I looked at that x3 equals zero cut and how my coordinate system near sky plus versus sky minus are different, you can see that it kind of like cuts across the antipodal points on the celestial sphere. I think like the, the, the funny business about the fact that like it's antipodally related, you can resolve by like looking at the behavior near like um, t I equals see. zero, I'd say, um, of like a different. I see. And, and if I understood correctly, I thought by taking different kinds of cuts, like maybe x yeah. equals zero, you would get different values because this charge is not yeah. conserved and that would correspond to including or excluding certain insertions, right? Exactly. Okay. No, exactly. Exactly. So, so what I'm saying is, is that I agree so, so, so basically what I was trying to say is that the, the thing that seems clearest to me is the fact that this canonical charges are related to soft theorems it seems robust in the, like in the sense that like the, the canonical charge is still this integral of the gauge field along that the boundary of that thing. The thing that's not clear to me is to what extent um, when I have like matter profiles that are smeared along the whole full hyperboloid, um, to what extent like different boost images of those are naturally still including. Um, I see. Like you're right. Like I mean, it's a clear picture for the the massless case, especially with the this 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 dictionary where I have these light ray supported guys. And they've, they've, so in in this context, I think I know clearly that all of the matter contribution from that massless charged particle is either inside, like on one side of my circle, to my my celestial sphere or not. Versus technically speaking, that that cut probably does um, intersect some of the smearing of the uh, celestial. Um, Sorry, of the, the the greens function that takes me from this massive hyperboloid, which I think of as being embedded in your i i zero or i plus sorry i plus, and um and the fact that the wave function is peaked at one point in the boundary. So, but I think this is the same type of issue that strictly speaking, if I if I looked at shadow transforms, like with the stress tensor, I would have the same concern here, right? Like I'm smearing something over a full sphere. So I um I'm sidestepping that. With the by sticking to the EM case or talking about these magnetic dual things to literally not have an inconsistent, it's not inconsistent, but it's definitely something where you have to worry if the picture is as clean, right? So, so what I'm saying is, is that the statement about the the surface giving me a canonical charge as a soft theorem tells me already that like I have this nice soft theorem word identity connection, but how easy it is to really directly apply something where I treat it. Um, as this radio evolution picture involves a little bit of a better understanding of the shadow, I think. Like, I think that in this context, it would say that massless scattering and treating the the uh, sibling self graviton as an SL two C um, current algebra would be the more natural thing uh, to to really strictly speaking never have to deal with some operators having support on one side or the other. So, um, is that sorry? I, I'm rambling because I think there is a caveat. Yeah, to, I, to, I think I understood some. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It was helpful. I think. Yeah. Yeah, because I think it's, there's a, there's aspects of it that are very clean, but I don't want to say that there's parts of it that just should still hold through if you're smearing things on the sphere. It's okay. just yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I have this question. I've always had this question regarding this program. That is, yeah. if you have an infinite set, infinite set of constraints. Yes. Uh, then wouldn't it constrain this matrix too severely? So I think. Okay, I think these these constraints are not. Um, I think it's something similar to how we want to reduce, like, whether we think of gravity as being there or not. Um, sorry, what I want to say is the following. Okay, so in the case of the stress sensor, the super translation symmetry, the constraint is not saying that there's an extra conservation law amongst the matter fields. Is that there's some gauge mode that equals um, something in terms of the the matter fields. To so to what extent? I guess I agree with you. Like, can you really, like, how much of the gauge field is determined by, um, by the other fields that are there? Obviously, it shouldn't be everything. You should be able to have like radiation just going through. Um, but I guess there is a sense in which um, it's not. No, the the, um, the constraints are on the S matrix, right? So the S matrix yeah, yeah, but the big constraints are on the S matrix in the sense of like. Um, like it's it's not like the same thing as like a global symmetry, right? It's a statement that there's like some soft insertions equal some hard assertions. If you don't have extra global symmetries, even in the context where you have these symmetry currents that we know have this, the universal soft theorems. So I think it's a milder. Uh, I agree with you. It's not obvious to me that there should be um, 
a full tower of like a universal soft theorems in like that. I think I'm really just reorganizing um, the S matrix in terms of different SL2C weights, and then maybe some of the. Um, no, yeah. if you have an infinite set of constraints. Yes, then you then would have then over. You would yeah, have, yeah. I would suppose you would have a trivial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would trivialize mm -hmm. the S matrix in, in a certain sense, right? Because yeah, but the, so the, what I'm saying is, is that it's the W infinity algebra, for instance, might only be robust when you don't have another helicity. Um, see what uh, when you don't have the second helicity there. So what I'm saying is, is that it wouldn't be surprising to me that like self-dual gravity has an infinite number of, right, of, um, but, of constraints. But isn't it true that the higher order constraints are not independent? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, so the double affinity algebra, for instance, you can generate the tower for, starting from a couple of them. Um, but sorry, so I guess the question is, um, great. Uh, they basically the infinite of number of symmetries coming from just the, the leading soft theorem and subleading soft theorem. Those definitely don't get in the way of having too many um, too many symmetries. For that tower, there is a question of whether when you add other interaction terms, you want to still have that symmetry algebra or not. Basically, that comes from some subalgebra of the of the OPEs. But if you have other terms, like you can ask if that closes or whatnot. So I think it's reasonable to question the robustness of the W infinity for all theories. I think that's still um, something we could ask, but the the I think that the the structure that I'm presenting with um, is still is still going to be useful in that context because you can look you can ask questions about like closure of the symmetry algebras and to kind of reorganize how you're looking at the um, like three point functions of the theory and things like that. Um, do, 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 do. I think what I'm saying is that I am I would like fall on the sword of the leading and subleading soft theorems for sure. And then I would not necessarily say that you, I would believe if somebody told me that like in some other theory, if I include the other helicity interactions, that there's something funny with the closure of the W infinity algebra, if I try to add more generators and look at their commutation relations um, because of this funny complexification that I have to do in the ZNC bar. But um, that doesn't Even mean that- you have the W infinity algebra, you have an infinite set of constraints, right? Kind of, but the thing is, it's not an infinite set of constraints in the same way. It's not like it's not like I have momentum conservation, then I have like another infinity of momentum conservation. It's that I have some flux balance laws, and so to what extent um, am I basically reducing the uh, like the part of the gauge field that is like somehow um, constrained by uh, my gauge fixing condition or whatnot? Is is like the part that I'm seeing in these in these soft theorem relations? So what I'm basically asking is. Um, right. I, I don't get. I don't get anything like um, like that. Hard equals soft. I don't get extra global symmetries. Sorry, like hard equals hard. I get hard equals soft. That means that there's certain amounts of radiation I can add, which are equal to some hard operator, and that's a slightly like more relaxed version of an infinite number of symmetries. But I agree with you. The W infinity starts becoming something where you should be concerned if you have too many symmetries for any theory of gravity, for instance. I think the W. One plus infinity is finitely generated, so there's only finite number of constraints. So yeah, so they, that's right. This is the the tension is whether I think I think the tension comes down to whether um, you have this algebra. Sorry. So what you what so what what uh, you're saying is that you have this sub algebra of the W infinity that you can get the full tower from. The question yeah. is is now if I have the other helicity sector that Andy's ignoring when he writes down the W infinity, uh, if together those close. I see. To, okay. So that's the thing. So yeah. So so what, what I'm saying is, is there's both of you can be right. <laughs> like I definitely have those generators very strict to single city sector stuff, but I guess I'm not 100 familiar with um, whether there's some closure issues with doing that for the other side of the um, other whole city sector, and then and then pushing that. So the S matrices that you are talking about are yeah. the normal S matrices in. But in, in, in normal scattering. No, but that's the beautiful thing is you, you can do any theory you want to. I think so long as the asymptotic structure is scry, I, I feel like you can do self-dual gravity. You can do, um, you can change the both theory. And then the question is, right, you'd want to see to what extent maybe like, for instance, some stringy behavior like in the UV gives nicer convergence properties for these melon transforms. So I think that the, the way that one would see some sort of like EFT version of things versus a stringy theory is like where the poles are in, in delta. And this is some a nice result of the first half of the paper with Nima and by Nima and uh, Pate, Ray Calario and Andy. Um, no, what, what I was asking was yeah. whether the in and out states are the plane waves or something else. 
No, they're not plane waves anymore. So they, they're they're smeared plane waves. So what happened? Sorry. So I guess I didn't write this. I think that, that, that's that's the that's the resolution of the thing. Yeah. So, so no. Have, well, I mean, in our have, basis, you have, it's you, a, have, if you have arbitrary waves coming in. Then yeah. they can they, they can be infinite set of constraints, and you can still have arbitrariness because of the arbitrariness of the mm. incoming waves. I think so. That's I would like to say that they're still. I, I think so. I, I would like to say that it, so long as you're on the principal series, they're isomorphic to the plane wave. So it's just like um, a different representation of the same type of data. I don't think I want to say that I'm including like poorly. But I, I think there's an order of limits where I want to say that I'm taking radiative data and then just representing it in terms of Formal dimensions instead of energies. And then I'm analytically continuing off of that and looking at the analytic structure and not seriously thinking about adding in like the growing modes that the bulk profile corresponding to integer values and delta would correspond to. So I, I still think it's a cool. I don't think I'm adding anything more, but maybe maybe what you could say. So here's here's a, a easy way to say, okay. The certain certain values of the formal dimension maybe give zeros and amplitudes, and that would correspond to the fact that the scattering problem like shouldn't support like scattering with wave functions that grow and are like crazy. Um, that might be one way of seeing um, this, this, this tower of things. It's that whatever, in, if you looked at the full phase space and tried to accidentally like leave in fields that are unphysical and overleading in R, there's some plectic partners would be subleading in R. And so does the act of restricting down to a well-defined phase space implicitly, like kind of, I'm looking at the symplectic form before I've done that versus afterwards. And clearly, like, it should be consistent to, to reduce those, get rid of those directions. But in some sense, like, the behavior of these values of delta might be probing that. So, um, I guess the thing is that if you if you consider not just plane waves, then you're yeah. you're you're increasing the phase space, you're enhancing the phase space in a certain sense, and then that would take care of the constraints. I think infinite set of so, so, so if, you have a, if you have an infinite dimensional phase space. Yeah. Then infinite set of constraints can still constrain the theory in such a way that it doesn't become trivial. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. So what I want to say to you is that I, I don't want to shut that idea down because I think there's probably a way to make that consistent with what I'm saying, which is that um, I think of everything in terms of analog containing the data on the physical phase space, which is this radiative phase space. <laughs> but that strictly speaking, aside from this order of R limits, like if I took the wave functions that I would have to the values of delta where I get these decouplings, it would literally be excluded from the phase space because it would be growing in R. Like it would not be in the physical phase space anymore. So I think that, I think there's a way that we can eventually come to terms with like what you're saying and what I'm saying is equivalent, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to say that I'm adding anything to the phase space. I'd like to say that somehow analog continuing off of the principal series is, 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 is it like somehow, like I, I, I basically, I, I think I don't quite understand how to, how to precisely, um, Say that what I'm saying about I'm continuing off of the, the the radiative data to values where the bulk wave function, if I could have done that first, would be excluded, like you're saying, is the same thing. There's some step in there that I'm a little bit wary about, but I think that it's the same spirit. Um, so I'm happy to say that there's something there that sounds right, but um, I'm not sure I would fully agree. Okay, so just food for thought. Take it, take it as food for thought. Oh, no, no, no. But I'm almost saying that I'm not saying I'm almost saying that you're right in the sense that like I, I know that those like I think implicitly when I'm saying that I don't need to add extra data to the face space, like I think there's a, there's a sense in which I want to be able to continue uh, in the power of R off of it and then see that like the only thing that's physical is the the principal series in some sense. So like, um, yeah. yeah. Yes, so just I had a different question. Yeah. Um, so you, you emphasize the difference between uh, the celestial holography approach and the yeah. kind of Carolian approach where you have this U coordinates. Yeah. yeah. But but shouldn't they be related? Like maybe some kind of dimensional reduction? Exactly, or... exactly. So, so so I'm not saying that they're um like the correlators of operators should be the same in either case, but the question of how you talk about evolving operators is gonna be different. So for instance, um like if I talk about the state at a given cut of U, then I see that there's this like standard like bonding mass momentum like flux through through the boundary, for instance. Versus in this picture, kind of the way that I view the fluxes would be like operators that are either inside or outside my contour on the celestial sphere. So there's something. Um, that, okay, what I mean to say is that from the point of view of 
if I took the Carolinian picture and then try to remove the U-direction, I'd be kind of screwed because the, the thing where the flux is leaving is like in the dimension that's not the S2. Versus from the radial evolution picture, I'm not losing anything along U, but I see that I'm enclosing an operator or not enclosing an operator anymore. So that's the sense in which from the 2D picture, this it's like kind of different than the Carolinian picture. But in either case, I would say that my S matrix element is really some boundary correlators on SCRI. And so however you want to compute those correlators, I'm happy to do. Or and or think about evolving correlators with some operators at some points and then to other points, you know, like use the symmetries to move the operators around and things like that. I see, okay. But so in this radial evolution picture, it seems like yeah. a, a state lives on a slice of the celestial sphere. Yeah. Is that true? Okay. I think that is, I'm sorry, I think that's a picture that people are implicitly using. There's something about continuing to two-two signature that I don't fully appreciate because um, basically we're using a lot of radial evolution techniques in a complexified way. <laughs> like you go from these um, collinear limits to the charge algebras of these commutators. So you're definitely using tools from radial evolution. Um, the Ketz Moody paper, um, so yeah, so the, basically this, the statement of this, this charge that I'm matching on the left-hand side is coming from the Kitz Moody paper where they first wrote down uh, a charge. But the key thing about it is they were just looking, I think they were starting from the soft theorem rather than from the bulk perspective. And so they were seeing that these soft theorems turned into like charges that you could define. Um, versus for me, I'm saying, oh, look, you could have jumped to that from the, like directly from the canonical charge, which is nice. So they had the left-hand side from a different perspective where they're, they were starting from soft theorems and then going towards um, things. And so this is what this was a little bit of a disjoint thing. So you had word identity equals soft theorems, and then going from soft theorems to currents. And so you could use any soft theorem to go directly to some like the sub soft photon theorem current and stuff like that. And that's where the asymptotic symmetry picture didn't keep up with it. Okay. okay. And, 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 and and then uh, so, so what is the relation with the entanglements? Because with it, sorry, I think yeah. I missed the last. With entanglement, because then this oh, yeah. this wind evolution is the modular Heim entanglement, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I'm 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 I, I would love to like that. I think that's part of the reason why I like giving the talk is to try to think about other ways of thinking. So like two things that come to mind, which I guess are interesting, is the first thing is, okay, like maybe what if someone didn't tell me what lambda was? <laughs> Could I see from this picture what values of lambda are good? Because there's a sense in which, for instance, uh, the radiative fields weighted with different powers of u would pick out different values of integer delta. That doesn't mean it's still not, like basically I don't see immediately the interplay between the phase space reduction to get to the charges. So to me, that's an interesting way of going. But again, I didn't want to open up a can of worms before I close one. Uh, the second thing I think is interesting is again, right, this um, like the holographic types of story that like like Suvrat and others uh, and look and others have been I'm looking at. Um, and I don't know if I have a good, um, I don't think I've played with the thought about it enough, like how things uh, carry over. But I do, okay. So what I do want to advertise is the paper with Herman, basically, we were looking at the behavior inside the Rindler wedge. And so one thing I think is kind of cute is that if I take this picture seriously, then everything looks like I'm, I'm totally fine with like my circle and my celestial sphere is some hyperplane in the bulk. But the cute thing about it is like the limit in which that circle goes to a point on the celestial sphere is not like it's not trivial in the bulk. It's it's like literally the the limit as I go to one of the Rindler horizons. So I think there's something kind of cute about the fact that like the story that Herman and I were doing with this, like thinking of Rindler trajectories, really should impact the state of like like the like a point in the celestial sphere if that makes sense. So what I think is lovely is that basically you can kind of see that whatever is happening in the original wedge isn't so innocent. Because it could affect the state on the Rindler horizon, which would affect like the like the point in the celestial sphere that you're starting from with like some sort of like state operator correspondence. Like the contracting that circle down is not trivial in the bulk. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so there's something that confused me. In, yeah, yeah. I think in your paper with Aman, you you mentioned something like you have two untangled celestial sphere. Oh. Okay. So okay. Maybe. So I don't know. Um. I wouldn't have called them in. I think with with Herman okay, okay. we have this picture of entangled. Yes, yes, but there, um, there I, I'm just thinking about preparing the Minkowski vacuum from the point of view of a Rindler vacuum. Um, and so, strictly speaking, so what one can still do. Okay, so, so depending how literally you take Rindler evolution, one can do that type of thing. 
the question is, is that I don't fully have a good, um, like the, the sense in which I see how these two pictures meet is literally at the horizon. <laughs> But um, strictly speaking, I assume that the migrations I'm doing with Herman, where I have to go to different signatures, might intersect this story because of like basically what these slices would look like if I were in two two signature. I'm, I have to think about um, basically. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think I would need to think about this more. Yeah. No. I I I, I feel bad at you because I have to, basically two papers that like connect at the level of what's the state of the horizon, <laughs> but I haven't thought more fully about how to see that. Like how to push the one into the other or go to different signatures and see that there's, I think there's, there should be more to there. There should be nothing inconsistent because they kind of meet up at the mutually exclusive place, <laughs> which is like, we're in the inside room ridge, outside room ridge. But uh, I, I feel ashamed that I haven't um, be appreciated fully how to take advantage of that picture here. Um, but it's got to come from this complexification of Z and Z bar, I think, because when you do that, like, um, you have more freedom with like where these, these surfaces look like in the intersect sky, I think. Um, yeah. uh, is there any more questions? People have okay, to, Sabrina, to nice now. talk. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sabrina. Uh, uh, um, can I just ask a big question to end? Like, yeah. uh, uh, like do, you, do you or all your collaborators have anything to say about black hole space times? Um, yeah, so my I think Herman has some things to say. I mean, so amongst scholars, and I guess Andy and and uh, would have others. So let me let me break down what I think people would say. So I think that Andy would say that with black hole space times you have um, soft hair, and what Herman and I would say is that there is a kind of extra degree of freedom coming from that horizon component that maybe um, even if you try to gauge super translation invariance way, you'd still have that relative frame. Um, and so in that context, I. <laughs> I guess the question is, I'm not 100% clear in the celestial context whether I would want to add another mode corresponding to like a horizon component for each of my like zero mode, like sorry, th there's certain, there's a spectrum of formally soft modes, um, which are related to uh, the first terms in these towers, basically there's a um, kind of a vertex operator one can construct that basically neutralizes fields under these, these, these leading asymptotic symmetries. And so those guys, um, can parameterize like a the super translation mode for like the inner the out uh, state. There's an antipodal matching condition that basically gives you just one super translation Goldstone mode. And then if there's another horizon component, I think Herman and I would say that there's another index there. But strictly speaking, I guess if you want to say that everything evaporates and you really only have one conformal boundary, then I think we would say that um, that the the spectrum of the celestial CFT has to be the same. So I I think I don't know of anything yet concrete that we can say from the point of view of um, like the celestial presentation of the story yeah. that hasn't been said by um, like talking Perry Strominger at some point yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was most thinking of uh, something like the Schwarzschild geometry, but I guess it's- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, it, so I think in the Schwarzschild case, I might be tempted to add more soft modes in with an index corresponding to the, in, like the, the black hole horizon or the white hole horizon. So like, uh, but this, in this case, you, have, you should have two spatial spheres, I guess, because there's two asymptotic boundaries. So yeah, so I guess my question is, is I think the setup would still reduce everything to a sphere, but then I would have, mm -hmm. for sure I would have like, I think I want to have extra, some of the zero modes would have more of them, I think. Um, so which I mean, like I could have a choice of BMS frame for in and for out and for one horizon and the other. And I think normally, oh, you grew, you found the link. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I like, I, I think I, I saw your email right before the thing, and I was like making like my, uh, my coffee, and I didn't get it. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, sorry. So basically, yeah, I would say that I, I think I would, in the Schwarzschild case, probably add some indices to my zero modes that I didn't go into here, like the dressing modes. But I don't know. Um, uh, presumably, that would be quite a different OPE algebra and things like that. I don't know what I would do with it beyond like, yeah, guessing that there's yeah. an extra degree of freedom. So like, it looks like a lot of work to do more with it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. But I, what I really love, sorry, one thing yep. I yep. love is that like Guevara's recent papers, I think there's something cool about seeing these geometries from scattering amplitude. So I'm all for like, like, I think that the, the closest thing one could do is maybe look at um, some like 
background that corresponds to like a boosted black hole as a primary wave function state. So like something like hard, like like scattering on top of a hard background or a, a short cell background or something like that, I think one could do before one could go to um, maybe a full quantum black hole situation. I see that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. If there, if there are there any more questions? No. Okay, if not, let's, uh, let's end the seminar. So thanks a lot. And Thank uh, you. let me end the meeting now. Bye. Yeah.